Today, why Australian politics is broken. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And I'm joined by John Adams. Hello, John. Hello, sir. Now, we're going to get deep and dirty into Australian politics today. Yes. So the first thing is, is that as we continue to talk about economic conditions in Australia and we talk about specific issues, whether it's about uh, bail-in or, or, or the Reserve Bank in gold or the financial claim scheme, we're getting uh, you know, comments from viewers about um, their concerns about the political system, uh, what are politicians actually up to, um, uh, and why the political system is not responding to, to the concerns and needs of the Australian people. Now, uh, this, so this morning I actually went to um, the University of Wollongong and presented a, a guest lecture to second year political science students uh, about my thesis about uh, why uh, Australian politics is broken. So, so, they, so this is a course uh, that they were studying about Australian politics and I, the, the professor who's a friend of mine said, can I come in and provide my sort of practical uh, perspectives on it so so i did um and and, and basically i've got a you know a number of key points that I, that I expressed to the students as to why i think politics is broken and i think that as we get further into these economic issues and people are get, become more concerned about the, this, the the state of politics i think it's worthwhile to just cover some of these broad points that i sort of told the uh, students this morning um so, so that people can have a, a bit of a, an appreciation in terms of where I think the system is failing, uh, but also give some people some ideas about maybe what they can do to help rectify the system. Okay. Well, I guess let's try and identify what the real problem is first, right? That's probably a good place to start, isn't it? Sure, sure. So, so, so where I started off this lecture was, was really going to the removal of Turnbull, and I sort of opened up the lecture and said, who, who was surprised that Turnbull was removed? And quite a few students put their hand up. Uh, and then I basically went to them and said uh, there was there was someone a couple of years ago who actually predicted that if Turnbull won the election, he would be removed after the election. And I said that was me. And I basically showed the uh, column I wrote for the Daily Telegraph um, on the 10th of June 2016, three, three weeks before the federal election. And I showed the clip from me being on the drum also predicting on the same day. And we've shown that in a previous episode. So, so yeah, so I basically said... Um, in the Daily Telegraph article, under such conditions, the party room would not hesitate to dispatch Turnbull and select another prime minister in either late 2017 or the first half of 2018. Now, Turnbull was removed in August of 2018, so I was about seven weeks off uh, in terms of the forecast, but the thesis that I expressed before the election in 2016 basically held true. Um, um, and, and we'll get into that uh, you know, uh, in a little bit more detail. But basically, going from that, I went through a whole host of factors that, to me, say, says something that, that the system is not working. So uh, when I look at um, voting trends, uh, I, think, I think the most telling statistic for me is the growth of the non-coalition, non-Labor, non-Green vote in the Senate. When you see in general elections of how people tend to vote in, in the House of Reps, because that vote tends to... Uh, determine who will be prime minister and who will be government, you see a, a still a heavy uh, inclination to vote for the major parties. But when it comes to the Senate and the Senate is a house to review a check on executive power, people today um, you know, are less willing to vote for the major parties compared to years gone by. And over the last four elections, we have seen that this non-coalition, uh, non-Labor, non-Green vote grow um, more and more. So 2007, it was about 11%. Then it grew to 13% in 2010. Then it jumped up to 23% in 2013, 26% in 2016. And you know, I was asked this morning, where do I think in the 2019 election where this uh, vote will go? I, 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 I'm expecting that that number will still go higher, probably in the area of 28 to 30%, because I don't think we've seen any behaviour from, 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 from the big three parties in, in the current parliament that would endear the Australian people to those parties. So I think there's more disenchantment, uh, more disillusion among the electorate with, with parliament in general. So I suspect that this, uh, uh, this particular Senate metric uh, will, will get worse going to next year. 
Um, and, and so, so, so underneath this slide, I've, I've, got, uh, I've got a couple of sort of key quotes um, that, that basically touch on um, uh, a couple of observations that, that people have been making over the last um, few years. So there was a University of Canberra study that showed that about 42%, only 42% of Australians were happy with how democracy worked. It also found that uh, trust in politicians and political pressures was at the lowest ebb in more than two decades. Uh, and, and, and this go, this was 2016, and then there was something back in uh, 2013 when they looked at uh, mapping social, social cohesion, and trust in the federal government was at a relatively low level, low level in 2013. Um, uh, and basically, you know, it showed a 21% decline from 2009 to 2013. Um, and also, there was a, uh, the lowest level of trust was in trade unions, the federal parliament, and political parties. So, so this so this was some statistical data that's been sort of rising over. The, the the last few years and, and we're seeing a manifest particularly in this metric around how they how people vote for the senate so uh so yeah so, so and, and and moving on from that so we've seen some very interesting trends but it, and, and some of these by-elections that have happened in uh this year but also in terms of 2017 so there's been a number of mps and senators that have uh, been in violation of section 44 of the constitution around citizenship and we've seen a number of uh, by-elections and basically what we have seen is is that uh, you know you look at it whether it's wentworth that just happened or braddon longman mayo ben long new england um the the combined alp coalition vote um you know the best that it got was 80 percent in ben long and that is because you had a sitting popular member in John Alexander, but also you had the former Labor um, Premier, uh, Kristen Keneally. She was the Labor candidate. So two very high-profile people. That attracted 60%. I mean, New England, um, you had uh, three-quarters of the vote, but this was of, uh, obviously when before Barnaby Joyce had the big scandal with, 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 with the mistress, with the baby, all of that. So, so still relatively... Uh, you know, 25% of people in New England rejected the two big parties. But then obviously you look at Mayo, which is Alexander Downer's former seat. A majority basically didn't like the, the, the two big parties. Uh, you look at Wentworth, um, uh, that just happened. You know, nearly 50% rejected the two big parties. And then when you look at, look at Longman and Braddon, 25 to 30%. So again, this is clear evidence, even, even though these are by-elections that, uh, whether it's the big two in the lower house or the big three in the Senate, there is a trend towards rejecting the uh, the, the, the historical orthodoxy uh, that we, we understand Australian politics to be. We are also seeing some, some volatility at the state level. So, so we look at some of these recent state elections where we've seen some very big swings, whether it's in Tasmania or, or New South Wales or Queensland, you know, we're talking, um, you know, 14 percent higher. I mean, historically, the Australian electorate tends to be quite conservative and you don't see these very big swings in sentiment. But, but, but in the post-2008 era, we are, we are seeing that. And obviously in New South Wales, we have had one by-election this year. We had one in 2016 uh, and basically we had nearly uh, 28, 29 percent in those two by-elections in Orange and Wagga Wagga. In both cases, oh, the Nationals held those two seats and there was a very big swing against those parties. Now, in both of these cases, the swing was not to Labor. It was to a... a another minor party um, that, that in terms of uh, where that swing went to. But, but, but again, it, it's showing that there's volatility in the electorate and people, if they are not happy with circumstances as they see or candidate selection, they are willing today more so to change their voting patterns compared to historical uh, times. I mean, you look at Australian voting in, in, say, the 60s and 70s, people tended to be quite stable, you know, that they would pick a camp. I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, only one or two percent voted against the big two parties in, 19, in, the, in the 60s, whereas now uh, we're seeing, you know, almost 25 percent rejecting the two, the, the two big parties and the, and the capacity or the willingness to uh, change their vote. Um, it, I mean, that, that's quite significant compared to uh, previous, uh, previous uh, periods gone by. So my observations, as I was saying to the students, is three big ob observations when it comes to the political system. Trust in the political system has collapsed. Uh, the electorate is less tribal and are seeking alternatives, and the electorate is susceptible to large swings in political sentiment. And what I was telling the students was that, that you guys, irrespective of your, of your political or policy views, as political scientists, your job, um, particularly as you're studying politics at university, is to recognise that the electorate, these Australian people are changing, and, and to understand why these changes are happening, and to start to 
think about what are the implications. I basically offered six key reasons uh, why I thought the system was, was breaking down. And basically, you know, the first one was, what is the purpose of an election? Is it about the mandate or is it about winning? Uh, another one was about the focusing on non-issues or poor policy development. Uh, third was poor governance and leadership instability. And obviously the removal of Turnbull was, was obviously a factor in that. Uh, the, what I call the rise of political hacks and machine men. And, and then we have a risk adverse political culture. And I think that a lot of this is driven by the amount of money politicians are paid. Uh, they are, particularly at the federal level, they are being paid, in my view, obscene amounts of money compared to the average, uh, what, what an average Australian would be earning. And I think that level of remuneration is actually um, making these politicians too comfortable um, and, and they're less willing to take political risks because they don't want to lose the pay and they don't want to lose the perks that come with high public office. We have this thing around being obsessed with the media and media culture. So, 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 so these are the big six factors that, uh, that I think are, are, are playing into why politics is broke. I wonder to what extent social media and the you know, the immediacy of the news cycle is having an impact on this. Because I, I, if I think of the US and Trump, right, he's been very successful in playing the social media card and, and doing a whole bunch of stuff. I think somebody told me recently that he had more than 1.3 million adverts running in social media. Yeah. yeah. So it's like the media rules have changed, right? Yes. I think I agree with you that the level of trust has definitely fallen, but trust, of course, has also fallen not just in the political system, but in fact, trust of large organisations, you know, banks or even the ABC. Yes. It's also falling as well. Yes. So this is perhaps a wider cultural thing as well as being a political specific thing. Yes, yes, I would agree with that. And, and I think that, that these forces are not just playing out in Australia. I think these are playing out right across the Western world, the US in terms of Europe. In terms of social media, I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think, yes, politicians are being caught up in social media, um, but, but also, uh, yes, Trump has been successful uh, in terms of uh, his use of social media, particularly in the run-up to the 2016 presidential campaign. But I think what we'll see is, I think where the polling is sitting at the moment, and we'll see what happens in a few weeks' time, the Democrats are likely to win the, uh, the midterm elections in terms of the House, the, 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 uh, House of Reps in the Congress. And certain people are, one of the reasons why they will be voting Democrat is because of Trump's use of social media. Um, yes, it is effective to put out an explicit message, but, but, but I think Trump and, and some Australian politicians have been caught up in the difference between the signal versus the noise. And everyone's being following the noise as opposed to you know, really focusing on your core thesis um, and, and your core message and trying to reaffirm that with the electorate and actually try to explain complex concepts to the electorate. Um, uh, and, and I think social media is effective in that. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing. I mean, the modern politician can't explain bail-in or the bail-in issue in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And yet we did three episodes, which are over an hour and a half, to really explain to the, uh, to the public what that is. And I think, so social media, there's an opportunity with social media to use it in a way to get around the mainstream media to explain hard or complex issues for those people who want to be informed. But I don't think politicians have been able to be effective in that use of social media, just like how we are sort of using it at the moment. Mm, okay, interesting. So, so yeah, so, 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 so basically to go into, the, the, you know, in terms of the first of these issues. So um, particularly when I was working for Synodinus in 2012, 13, there was this whole debate about what is the purpose of the election? What is the purpose in terms of being um, in the opposition? Uh, is it to win the election or is it to have a mandate to govern? Now, I've always had the belief that opposition, the purpose of, of being in opposition is to argue for a mandate to get democratic consent and then, and then use your mandate to enact policies that will meet the agenda that you've put forward to the people. That's how I think the, 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 the process should work. Um, but uh, what I saw in 2012-13 with, with, with the Abbott Credlin team was that, no, uh, there, if you don't win an election, you can't do anything from opposition. Therefore, you must win at all costs because otherwise it's an exercise in fertility.
1993 election plays a very critical role in this whole thinking because John Hewson, um, who, who, who I know very well, he didn't care about politics. He didn't care about the polls. He just said, these are the pressing challenges of the nation. Here is a comprehensive set of public policy proposals. The electorate, here they are. Um, this is what I stand for. Um, what do you think? And initially, Fight Back uh, was very popular. Uh, it, it was sufficient to get Hawke knocked off. So the coalition uh, 2PP went, went up dramatically. Hawke became very weak politically, uh, and they gave the, Keating the opportunity to knife the Prime Minister and become Prime Minister himself. So without Fight Back, Hawke would not have lost the Prime Ministership, in my view. Uh, and so, so it was actually very effective in the short term. And then Keating ran a scare campaign on GST, but also on terms of Medicare. Um, and that was basically what allowed the uh, Labor government to win re-election in 1993. But because he tried to do it the right way and he failed, people in politics today say, well, uh, the right way didn't work, therefore we, you know, there's no point in arguing for a proper mandate because if you try and you lose, well, you can't do anything. anything. Now, on this issue, in my, uh, what I've sort of argued to people is without 1993, 1998 would not have happened in terms of the Howard GST tax reform. So what the value of 93 was, it, it actually gave Hewson and the coalition the ability to explain tax policy, the limitations of tax policy and the need for tax reform. And because he, Houston, effectively took the government, uh, took the public through a education process. Um, uh, people in, in 98 were able to swing around to say, okay, well, we, we think, we, we understand why tax reform is obviously important. Um, uh, and when Howard Costello put their package forward, I mean, a majority of Australians um, were willing to accept that package. Now, having said that, because there were some stumbles in the 93 campaign, particularly with the Bertha Cake issue, and Senator Dennis and Howard and, uh, you know, looked at the trial run, saw how the package was constructed, how the arguments ran, and basically were able to put a package together that allowed um, the coalition in 97, 1997, 1998 to put something that was not going to repeat the mistakes of 93. So, 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 so my position is, is that if there are public policy problems affecting the country, um, even if you put the right policies forward and the electorate is not convinced that these policies are correct, if the, if the problems are legitimate um, and they don't, um, they're not resolved in the short term, uh, you know, if the solutions and the problems hold true, the electorate over time will, will come to that position. So, so, so for me, uh, you know, politicians think cycle by cycle, whereas I think for political parties, they need to be a little bit more strategic and think to themselves, well, if we can't win the argument at the next election, can we win it in two or three elections because the, the solution and the argument is so significant and compelling that we can convince more Australians moving forward? So, so I think that's important, uh, and, and, but politicians don't think that way. And this is why we see the winning at all costs, the use of slogans, the use of promises. Um, you know, we will promise X billion here, X billion there, because they want to um, you know, be generous with the popular, uh, with, with the public, and and, and they want to win. And, and obviously, it's it, these elections are very competitive, uh, and, and they want to just win at all costs. So, 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 that, so that's obviously what I think in terms of um, how the purpose of the elections has has resulted in the political system breaking down. Then, then we look at the the issue of. Um, we look at pressing, poli pressing uh, policy issues. So there's a, there's a number of things that we've spoken about from the, the household debt bubble to cost of living to, the, to property prices to uh, uh, in terms of in, we've spoken about foreign debt, we've spoken about, about government debt, we've spoken about congestion in capital cities. So there's a whole host of factors, p policy issues, which to be honest are just not being addressed by Parliament. It's not addressed by uh, the politicians. And I think that these ongoing issues, because they're not being addressed in a serious manner, that's also leading to a loss of trust and loss of frustration uh, among the population uh, with Parliament and with politicians. So I think, I think that's factor two. Uh, obviously, factor three is we're seeing a revolving door of leadership, particularly at, a, at the federal level. Um, and, you know, you look from 2001, you look at the change of the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, in, in 17 years, we've had 12 changes in terms of, of the leadership. 
Um, and, 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 and obviously, here's a quote from, uh, in terms of Mark Latham, what he said in the Latham Diaries. You know, a quote, I'm a, a, a part of a dying breed in the ALP. Whatever happened to the party's interests and ideas in reform, it has been sucked dry by the machine professionals and smarties face the fact labor stuff. So this is Latham in 2005 talking about the ALP, but having worked in the coalition, I think this is a statement which is equally applicable to the other side. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be neutral here and saying that this phenomena isn't one-sided, it's happening to, to both sides. So, so that's uh, factor number three. Now, factor number four is, and to be honest, when I was talking about this today in the lecture, uh, I found this to be quite interesting because there were, so this, this issue of the rise of political hacks, there were political hacks political operatives in the audience. Yep. There, there were students who play a, a active role in student politics with the view of rising up the party machine to, to get into parliament. So, so basically, when we look at this diagram here, you know, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the liberal side because I have more expertise there. But basically, you have the university student becoming a factional warrior. So you, know, you join the Liberal Party, you, you become a part of uh, you know, uh, one part of the uh, party, a group. So in New South Wales, you've got these terms of the moderates, the soft right, the hard right. Um, you, you join in one of these groups, and your mission in the party is not to further the interests of the Australian people or to learn about public policy issues or to actually grow the, the party itself. It is to advance your group or your faction within the party. Um, and, and, and that behaviour manifests itself into short-termism, um, uh, obsession with political power, Machiavellian tactics, unethical practices, etc. So, and we're, we're not just seeing this in the Liberals, we're seeing this in the ALP, but also, but, but particularly in terms of the Liberal Party, uh, I mean, some of these factors are leading to uh, a lot of people just being disenfranchised within the Liberal Party, and that's why you've seen this sort of, a number of public, pe public personas have I've said I'm quitting the party, um, you know, the culture is too rotten. And to be honest, that was part of the reason why I decided to leave the Liberal Party because of how the culture is. But basically you see a university student becoming a factional warrior. They may go to be a, be a party for sure. They may go to be a, a, a political advisor. And then from there, they may get a short-term job in the private sector. They may run for local council. And then from there, they'll go to run for parliament. Uh, and we're seeing this system of, as opposed to the party trying to pick the cream of, of, the, of the party membership or the cream of society who can make the best contribution to parliament. We're just seeing the you know, people going through this particular internal system um, and, and they're not really being groomed to govern. So, so this was a part of the conversation this morning is when you look at 19th century England, yes, it was heavily focused by aristocrat, aristocratic families about who was in the House of Commons or who was in the Lords. But there was an, there was an obligation among the English elite that um, you know, in order to fulfil your responsibilities to England, but also to the crown, you had to behave in a certain way. You had to educate yourself. You had to be articulate. You had to understand sort of the issues, uh, and you had to be sort of you know like a, a man, you know, you know, in the military service, or you had to be a man of the law or a man of letters. So you actually had to be someone of ability and distinction to be able to serve into Parliament. But but that sort of grooming about who should be in parliament. We, we clearly clearly don't see that. And what we're seeing at the moment is, in my view, poor candidate selection, um, not only in, in the coalition, but also in, in terms of Labor. So, so obviously, you know, one of the interesting stories is, is that we had uh, uh, Ian Chubb, Professor Ian Chubb. He was the uh, former vice chancellor at ANU. He then became on to be the chief scientist. Last year, he went on ABC radio, and I was driving down to Canberra listening to the professor talk, and he basically said that uh, there's clearly several or many or a majority of parliamentarians who, in his view, are just not up to the job of being a parliament. That he, they didn't think he he expressed they didn't he they didn't think he he didn't think they had the intellect or the uh, depth of knowledge to be able to understand complex policy issues so that they could um, uh, understand what the right problems were, what the right solutions were, um, uh, and then how to govern the country forward. So this is his own comments on the public record. And obviously, when we've talked about bail-in, for example, and, and, and certain DFA listeners have emailed the um, certain members of parliament, uh, members of parliament basically saying, 
well, there's no issue here. Uh, there's no bail-in uh, in terms of the issue. And yet you and I have, because of our expertise, been able to go into the detail and, and, and show the viewers, no, there is actually a problem here. But most parliamentarians could uh, have the ability to think about these issues in a systematic way. Um, I mean, I mean, and that's why we're getting these non-responses coming back um, for, for, from, a, from a whole host of people. So, so, so that was uh, issue four. Issue five for me is about remuneration. So, so in, the, in this table, we basically see that when you look at the remuneration of the prime minister, but also the ordinary uh, member of parliament, that Australian politicians, particularly at the federal level, are being paid well in advance of what I would say other uh, jurisdictions are being paid. So these are 2015 levels, but you know the ordinary backbencher now is clearly above two hundred thousand um, dollars and again you know there is no um, prerequisites to getting into parliament so there's all sorts of people who who in the private sector can't generate two hundred thousand dollars worth of income are being paid that sort of amount of money and and, and if you're a cabinet minister you're on four hundred thousand dollars plus the prime minister's on five hundred thousand so my thesis on a remuneration is is that um, most of these people in the private sector can't generate this level of income, so they are being paid well and above their ability, but also what the market would pay um, if they were doing other things. Therefore, uh, one is they're obsessed with holding office because they're getting this level of pay. But two, when it comes to political decision making, uh, why do something controversial that may rock the boat uh, uh, when you're on such a good wick in terms of uh, pay and rumor, uh, in terms of benefits, etc. So I think that the pay is actually driving a risk adverse culture within Parliament. And, and I've said to several people, if I was if I was Prime Minister, day one I would announce a 40% pay cut for all politicians, including the Prime Minister, because I think what you want in politics is people driven by conviction and ideas in the public interest, as opposed to saying, I can get rich or I can advance my financial interests uh, by being in parliament. I mean, the reason why parla parliamentarians are paid is, so the first time in the, in the UK politicians were paid was in 1911. And, and this is when, when working class uh, uh, English or British people started going to the House of Commons. Well, they didn't have the means to support themselves being a parliamentarian. So for them to, for the working class to have working class representation, these working class parliamentarians needed some sort of income to, 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 to get them by. Uh, so in the 19th century, when everyone was rich, the aristocrats, no one was paid in parliament because it was the sense of duty. Uh, and so... In 1911, they started paying the parliamentarian in the UK 400 pounds a year, uh, and this was to ensure that working class people could have their own people into parliament to represent their interests. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's the purpose of why we pay parliamentarians to say that if if you're poor or if you're middle class and you want to be you want to represent poor or middle class people in parliament, you get a level of money to help you with that process, not to get rich. So the average uh, income for the average Australian household is in the order of seventy to $75,000. And yet even the backbencher is paid two and a half times more than what the average household is paid. And yet in many of these circumstances, the ability of the parliamentarian is in requisite with the level of compensation. So I think that's actually driving some issues with the political culture. And then, and then the last issue is, is that you know, politicians are obsessed with the media. So this is a quote from Lindsay Tanner, the former finance minister, when he uh, wrote um, his book, Sideshow, about you know the, the dumbing down of democracy with uh, in terms of um, in terms of the media. Uh, he basically had this quote. You know, the creation of appearances is now far more important for leading politicians than is the generation of outcomes. This produces a good deal of deception and, appro and an approach that I call the politics of the moment. Winning today's micro argument is all important, and tomorrow can look after itself. This breeds a collective mentality of cynicism and manipulation. Policy initiatives are measured by their media impact, not by their effect. So, so again, superficial politicians focusing about winning these micro arguments in the media, not th thinking through the effects of public policy, not thinking strategic about where to take the country in the next 20 to 30 years. And I think this is part of the frustration. People want vision, people want strategic thinking from parliament, and yet the media culture, the, the selection of candidates, the remuneration, the, the instability around the leadership, uh, but, but also some of these other factors about the purpose of elections, I think these are the big factors that are driving 
uh, uh, Australian politics to be, in my view, broken. And, and I didn't find a lot of pushback in terms of these points. Uh, but, but, but obviously, the question now is, is that if these are the factors that are making the system not work, and this is part of what we're talking about in, in some of the episodes we're talking, well, how do we get the system to, 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 be able to, like, to be able to reform itself so that parliament starts to address the pressing issues of the country? Mm. So do you have answers or do you not have answers as yet? I think that the corrosive culture of the ALP and the Liberal Party is so bad um, to be honest, I'm very sceptical that it can reform within itself. Now, particularly on the Liberal side, there are certain voices. So, so there's a gentleman called John Ruddick who just released a book um, about democratic reform. Basically, they say that, for example, in the UK, in the, in the Tory party, the, the party membership uh, selects the, the leader of the party as opposed to the parliamentary uh, uh, party members. So, 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 so basically... He, uh, John Ruddick, has advocated for uh, democratic reform, for, for members to have more say about candidate selection, about the policy direction, about having a, a full-on convention of the party where, you, where the party membership determines the platform. So, the, you know, the Tory party, but also the uh, Canadian Conservatives, um, you know, that they have some of these practices which can improve party culture. So, so, so there are people trying to drive this from within the parties, and there's a lot of resistance among those who hold power to allow these reforms to go through. So I think it's too early to determine whether those efforts will be successful or not. But I suspect that what we need, what we will probably see is more fracturing of the vote. And probably, so we have a, f a number of micro parties that have solicited some, uh, some level of support. I don't think any one of them have, has, has ignited the population to rally around, whether it's a, a Bernardi or a Hanster or a Catter, et cetera. But, uh, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't see uh, enough movement by the big parties to, to show me that they are going to reform their culture, they're going to actually have better candidates, have, have better policy, and bring back the population to their political party. Okay. So that sounds to me as though the system is broken. The people who are in the system have no intention of fixing it because they don't really think that it needs fixing. And so therefore we're going to see continued bifurcation between what the community needs and wants. Yes. Because they actually do want real outcomes on climate change and bank reform and those things, right? Yes. Whereas internally in, within the political machine, it's all about the next election, it's about winning, and it's about all the things you've, you've spoken about. Yes, yes. So, Look, it's, it's about power, it's about winning. You know, for some of them it is about ideology. Uh, and and so, so obviously, you know, uh, I'm happy to say I have beliefs, I have uh, values, I have convictions, but, but I, I try to uh, shape my policy views based on the evidence I have. So there have been times where I've had initial hypothesis about a particular issue, but, but then when I dig into it and I find what the facts are, well, I change my views based on what I find as opposed to just being stuck in the mud and saying no matter what the facts are, I'm not going to change my mind. And, and there are those sort of people in the parties in parliament that say that whether it's climate change, whether it is sort of, you know, the, this issue of socialism versus capitalism, no matter the outcomes of the, of the system, of which is the better economic system to produce the results for society, um, I'm just going to stick with my views and I'm not going to change based on the evidence in front of me. So therefore the concept that politics is the art of the possible suggests to me that in fact people's vision of what is possible is much more limited now than it was. Yes, yes. And that seems to me to be the ultimate conclusion. So it is broken. So, so, so it is broken, but, but what I think what we're seeing is particularly through, um, you know, in terms, of, in terms of some of these episodes, but the other uh, social media channels is, is that there is a uh, potential in this country, but also in Western democracies, for new conversations am among disaffected constituents to come together to rally around a set of proposals, and then that to galvanise into parliamentary uh, representation, ultimately to government. And obviously the best example of that that I can point to is 
Italy. Mm. So, so you've got the Five Star Movement, you've got the League. Uh, you know, I think as the Five Star Movement started off from an internet-based campaign, they formed a party, they got some people, they said, with the League, will you join with us? And we can form a new government that's independent of the old political order. So whether we see that sort of coming together in Australia or not, as, as in the Italian situation, you know, I think we're in the early stages. But if the political establishment doesn't recognise uh, their faults, and the and the systemic issues that the system has, you know, there'll be uh, you know some sort of grassroots populist um, uh, uh, sort of uh, campaign manifestation into some sort of new political forum, um, and, and that will obviously have profound effects for the country and public policy moving forward. John, thank you. Very provocative thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there you have it. John Adams' view is why politics is broken, what needs to be done to fix it. I wonder what John's going to do to help. See you next time.